Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Golden 30. My name is Karen Gray. I am the Adult and Senior Services Specialist for Prince George's County Memorial Library System. And once again, welcome to the Golden 30, where we talk about topics that are geared to adults. This program will be presented as a virtual program and will also be available by phone anytime 24 seven by calling 240-455-5460. And I'm gonna give the number one more time, 240-455-5460. Today, we will be talking about advocacy in a health crisis knowing your rights and how to enforce them when you are in the hospital. And this will be presented by my friend, Mark Ash. Mark Ash is, uh, hi, Mark. <laughs> um, so Mark Ash, it works with Right at Home, a private duty in home care agency. And he works in business development. He has a universe, um, he, I'm sorry, he has a Bachelor of Arts in Economics at the University of Maryland. He worked in healthcare industry for over 20 years, a former consultant in developing adult daycare centers. He is experienced with skilled nursing facilities, spoken to hundreds of seniors on topics such as wellness, fitness, and remaining active and safety issues. So he brings a wealth of information and knowledge to us today. So welcome, Mark. And Thanks, we can go ahead and get started in presenting today. Thanks, Carrie Ann, and welcome, everyone. Today, we're going to look at the topic of advocacy in a health crisis through a case study that, that I've developed with, with others, a, a Jarrah psych nurse and an elder uh, law attorney. And this is all fictitious information. We're not putting anyone's private health information here. So to examine this topic, we're going to meet Sally Smith. Sally Smith for the purpose of this conversation is a 76 year old woman who is a widow of a Korean war veteran. She's a mother of three and a grandmother. She has Medicare part A and B and supplemental health insurance. And for the purpose of this discussion, she was brought to the hospital with signs of a stroke. And we're using this because this is a very common situation that occurs. What does Sally need to know? Sally has legal rights, Sally has medical rights, and Sally has personal rights, and we want to make sure that all of Sally's rights are protected. So we look at the topic of advocacy. If Sally is conscious, if Sally can think for herself, understand the situation that she is in, and by understanding the situation then can voice her consent or opinion regarding medical treatment, Sally can be her own advocate. She's conscious, she's aware of the situation, she can speak for herself. That means she can advocate for herself. But in this case, and for the purpose of this presentation, Sally is what's considered incapacitated meaning that she cannot speak for herself or she is not able to understand her current situation and provide the proper consent for medical care that she may need. So who would advocate for Sally in this case? The first case, Carrie, would be a person named in her health, as her health care power of attorney. Now, this is, and we're going to talk about these documents. A healthcare power of attorney is someone that you choose who will speak for you in the time of a medical situation. Many people have this. Uh, they assign a medical power of attorney. It could be a spouse or a sibling. And they assign this person before they have a surgery or something of that nature. And you can assign that person just for that particular event. Or you could assign them as a durable power of attorney, meaning or it's ongoing. And in this case, it's, it's a, a, a medical crisis. So hopefully Sally has chosen her advocate in advance. 
It could also be a person who is named in her at in her advanced directives or living will. Or in some cases, a person could be a guardian of the court. So it could be uh, the, the guardian of that person or a surrogate who's going to speak for her as, as, an, as an advocate of the court. So it's important that we have certain documents in place to protect, in this case, to protect Sally. The first we talk about, as I mentioned just a moment ago, is that health care power of attorney. It's a legal document which names the person or agent who will speak for you in the event of a medical situation. I recommend having a health care power of attorney and having a backup health care power of attorney in the event that your primary advocate cannot be there for you, that you always have a backup. The second is your advanced directive or living will. It's a legal document which states what your wishes are, how you would want to be treated as it relates to medical treatment, life-sustaining measures, pain management, and if you're in a terminal condition or end-stage condition, what decisions you would want made. And the third document, Karen, is, is called a HIPAA authorization. The HIPAA law protects everyone's private health information. So if you, and in this case, Sally, who reports to the hospital may have a, a couple of children and grandchildren, in order for the hospital or the medical staff to talk to all of those people regarding Sally's medical condition, she should have a HIPAA authorization signed for each of those individuals. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these documents, but this is something that you should have in place. And it starts with this, Sally's advocacy choices. Sally's had a stroke. Sally's taken to the hospital at a critical time. She may be suffering from paralysis on one side of her body. She may be suffering from speech impairment, potential for cognitive loss, which, is, which could affect memory and problem-solving abilities. She could have issues with controlling her, her bowel or bladder. She may not be able to walk or even move, depending on where the stroke has affected her. And her emotions could be uncertain. So this is a critical time. This is not the time to make decisions on how someone would want to be treated. This actually should occur before a crisis ever occurs. So what is Sally's viewpoint? And I'm gonna to touch on this in a moment. Sally hopefully has had what I call the conversation with her family. You know, Karen, we have, um, while, while we're all in, in good health and while we all have our wits about us, it is important that we decide on our own how we would like to be treated in the event of a health crisis. And then what we should do is, and I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later too, is we should bring our family into that discussion and share with our family how we would want to be treated in the event of one of these types of situations, if God forbid this was to occur. And so what you do is when you have that conversation, you put on paper what your wishes are. And that is the advanced directive or living will. In many states, there's a form called a MULST form, a medical order for life-sustaining treatment. In that document, you can list what your wishes are as it relates to medical treatment and so on. But the fact that you've had the conversation with your family means that everybody's on the same page and will work toward the best outcome for you. In this case, Sally. So Sally has had a stroke. In this case, advocacy is completely up to someone else. The person who she has appointed as her advocate or the person who she has chosen as her backup. And advocacy is critical, especially in the early stages of the stroke, because you want to make sure that you take all the egos out of it and you work towards Sally's 
best interest for her most her her her, her greatest possible outcome from the stroke. So you want to make sure that she's getting the proper treatment at the proper time. So who does it for Sally? It could be her family member who she, you know, she's chosen her, her sibling or, or her spouse as her voice, and then maybe one of her siblings as a backup. Or she could have hired a professional advocate. Perhaps that's an attorney, a an aging life care manager, or as some people know them as geriatric care managers, or a patient care advocate. She could have chosen one of those who, who will represent her professionally. So it's important to have advocacy lined up before there's a crisis. How does advocacy work? This goes back to what I was just saying. The family should agree on a plan of care. In this case, Sally, should have had the discussion in advance with her family, how she would want to be treated. Then she chooses one person to advocate for her, one person as a backup, and that way she puts her wishes on paper. Those advocates are there to carry out Sally's wishes. You know, Carrie Ann, in my, in my professional career, I've met families with where there's, you know, adult, both, both the adults are alive and then they have seven adult children. And if God forbid one of those adult parents was, was to go to the hospital and you have a spouse and seven children and their spouses, if that's necessary, coming to the hospital, that's too many voices representing too many perspectives. The main perspective that should be represented is in this case, Sally's perspective, that person who is going through the medical situation. So when you plan for this in advance, you can plan for successful outcomes by having all of this lined up in advance. All caregivers involved should understand the questions that need to be asked and what treatments to expect. I recommend this. If Sally goes to the hospital with signs of a stroke, one can get online or call the local stroke association and find out a list of questions. I always recommend that you go to a trusted source. You can go to the National Institutes of Health and find a list of questions for a certain medical condition. If you're unaware, many people are not affiliated or understand the healthcare system. So you can educate yourself at a trusted source and find a list of questions that you should be asking the practitioners if that's necessary. And it's important that the family agrees because if the family doesn't agree on that plan of care, it's twice as hard to get the hospital staff to buy into providing the best support for Sally. So how do you communicate best for the rights of Sally in this case? First, it's important to recognize who the various players are. You know, the hospital, Carrie, and when we were kids, the hospital was different. Our families could call our, 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 the family physician and the family physician could come and see you in the hospital. And that does not happen now. The hospital has their own specific staff called hospitalists that are there specifically to care for people only while they're in the hospital. So that hospitalist may not know Sally in this case. And there's other staff in the hospital who may not know or may not have never met Sally. So it's important when we show up at the hospital that we have a list of Sally's medications, a list of Sally's health situations, what, what Sally is treated for regularly, and if she has any, any uh, ongoing health issues. But then when we're communicating for Sally, to advocate for Sally's best rights, we want to find out who it is that's coming into the, into the hospital room to treat her and what their role is and how often they will be visiting. So we can understand best how to advocate for Sally. You know, an effective advocate does these things. They ask 
questions and observe. Again, not to satisfy their own ego, but for the best outcome for Sally in this case. They learn to understand the importance of remaining emotionally steady and polite. And we acknowledge, they acknowledge that there will be stress and uncertainty. It's so important to stay polite, to get the hospital staff to be on your team, everybody working with the same goal in mind, the best outcome for Sally. It takes patience and skill. It's easy when you're in a stressful situation like that to lose your temper, to say things that bring anger to the patient. The best thing for Sally is a calm environment. If it's too stressful, if it's too many things, if there are too many things going on, it may exacerbate Sally's situation or make her feel more uncomfortable in the bed. So the, the advocate should have the skill in asking for the additional services and things that Sally may need so that Sally's best outcome is in mind and that, she, that things can get done for Sally in the best time. Avoid confrontation. You never want to confront the hospital staff. It's, again, best to communicate well. Have them advocate for Sally as well. Because if, if you... If you yell and raise your voice and throw temper tantrums in the hospital, the staff will be afraid to come to the room. And you want the staff to be there attending to Sally's needs. So it's best to stay level-headed, calm, it's better for Sally, and it's better for Sally's care. Understand the hospital system. The staffing, as I mentioned earlier, it's done by hospitalists or intensivists who manage the arc of the patient during many of the acute parts of the person's life. So it's best to have a copy of the health history. It's best to have the medications and understand the language of the hospital. If you don't understand what a person's role is as they come into the room, ask. Arm yourself with proper information okay so it's not strange so it's not scary find out who the person is and what their role is okay and you know there's there's not signs there's no directional there's directional signs to tell you what wing of the hospital you're in and so on but there's not directional signs to tell you who each person is and what their role is so if you ask a nice question they'll be able to 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 guide you so it's important through that process that Sally, you're working toward the best in outcomes for Sally. And understand that, especially as it, as it relates to something like a stroke, that after Sally is in the hospital, Sally may need to go to a rehabilitation unit in the community before she goes home because she may need things like physical therapy, occupational therapy speech therapy, something in some cases respiratory therapy. So while she may have been receiving those therapies in the hospital, it's also important that you find a rehabilitation center outside of the hospital that's able to provide those services and help toward a speedy recovery. So one of the things that a, a family member or advocate can do before Sally discharges from the hospital, they can check out local rehabilitation centers, local to where they live or local to where Sally lives. They can check those out. They can tour them and find out what might be the best fit for Sally. Okay, And it's important that you prepare, again, always working toward the best outcome for Sally. I keep... I keep beating up that point, Karen, but I want to make sure everybody understands it's, it's not about egos. It's about the best place for Sally to recover, rehabilitate, and return quickly to the community. Okay? And the discharge itself should be something that, that is a, a written plan. And I'm going to talk about that. So 
what does it mean? It means caregivers first have to learn quickly what, what the rehabilitation center is, what, you know, how to choose a good one, and, and make sure that it's appropriate for Sally. That you're getting Sally ready to move to that next phase of care. And that the discharge planner, usually in the hospital, it might be a social worker or, or a, a, a case manager, is helping you and assisting you in making the right plans. The discharge itself should be what's called an orderly discharge. It should be done in a timely fashion. It shouldn't be in the late afternoon or after dark. This could confuse Sally even more. And it also should be done where when Sally goes to the next phase of care, that that, that institution, whatever it might be, whether it's home or whether it's a rehabilitation center, is going to be able to provide the continuity of care taking off right where she left off while she was in the hospital. So there has to be a written set of instructions for the discharge for Sally. Prescriptions. If somebody is sent to a rehabilitation center in the evening, the rehabilitation center may not have the prescription that that person needs once they arrive at the rehabilitation center. They have to order it from their own pharmacy. And so that might not even come in until the middle of the next day. So it's so important that a person is not transferred to a rehab center at a bad time because it might mean they can't get their medications properly or the proper other medical treatments because the rehabilitation center isn't ready for them. So there has to be a written set of instructions. There has to be a plan and it must be so that the continuity of care can continue for Sally without, without a, a missed step. If there's other referrals, whether it's home health, uh, rehabilitation or other types of, of care, those should all be written and should be available at the time of discharge. As I mentioned, you have the right to an orderly discharge. You can make sure that when you're getting ready, to, when, they're, when the hospital is getting ready to discharge Sally, in this case, that the written instructions are there, the prescriptions are there, the next steps of care are there, and that's all critical to the outcome for Sally. But you also want to understand if Sally has been a patient in the hospital for more than two or three days, that she has been what's called an admitted patient to the hospital. There is a Medicare loophole that some hospitals will use where they'll put someone in what's called observation. And if someone's under observation in the hospital and not an actually admitted patient to the hospital, if, if that person is being sent, if Sally is being sent to a rehabilitation center right from the hospital and she was only under observation, her rehabilitation care may have to be paid for privately because Medicare may not cover this type of situation if she hasn't had a three night hospital stay as an admitted patient. So always, as an advocate, be aware of your, the person you're advocating for, be aware of their medical rights, of their legal rights, be aware of their financial rights and make sure you're protecting them in that instance as well. And then on the discharge, there are other resources which, which you may want to consider. And those are, as I mentioned, the, the Skilled Nursing and Rehabilitation Center, which is going to do the, the subacute rehabilitation for Sally. There could be what's called skilled home health, where an agency can provide therapies in the home once it's appropriate for Sally to go home. So they can provide physical occupational therapy, wound care. Some can provide respiratory care and so on in the home. If Sally's if Sally arrives at home and needs additional care with her personal care, with her hygiene, with her activities of daily living, 
Sally's family can have an agency like the one I work for right at home come in and provide non-medical home care and aid that can assist in that regard. There are companies that provide durable medical equipment who can provide hospital beds and Hoyer lifts and other things that a person may need to, to continue to rehabilitate at home. There are patient care advocates. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, aging life care managers or geriatric care managers that can assist to make sure that all steps of care are ongoing uh, you know, as, you, as you discharge. So it's important as the advocate to make sure that all the steps are in place that you're working toward the best outcomes and that Sally recovers well and continues to rehabilitate. I am so blessed and thankful to be a part of this program. I appreciate you, Carrie, in for uh, inviting me to participate. Again, my name is Mark Ash with Right at Home. Uh, my contact information is here uh, on the final slide here. So if you do get the presentation, uh, it's available. Uh, for those on the phone, my email is mark at rightathomemd.net, and my direct cell is 410-292-2405. Carrie and I thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity, and it's, it's a blessing to be a part of the Prince George's County Memorial Library System. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Mark Ash. Um, you have any questions, Carrie and did, did I? Did I cover everything that uh, I think you definitely did. I just want to highlight that. I think it's important that, you know, everyone, sometimes people might get afraid of the conversation, but not only is it important to have the conversation, but to also document, have it notarized, whether you are um, going um, ahead and writing it down or seeking a lawyer or seeking advisement not only have the conversation, but have some kind of written directives available. Um, so I definitely yes, thank you for that presentation. And just for our viewers and our listeners, um, know that the library has several resources to help you out, um, whether it's looking up information on different medicines or different reading different health journals on different illnesses, to also getting forms that you need or documents that you need for power of attorney or health care, different health care forms. So we have a resource that's available on our website, website called Yale Legal Forms. So they have forms for DC, Maryland, and Virginia, plus federal legal forms for wills, name changes, contracts, and like I said, power of attorney or other health care needs. So please go to our website and check that out. Also, um, you can visit us at pgcmls.info backslash events to check out our other um, events that we have going on, plus our YouTube page. You can just search PGCMLS to see other archive videos that we have all available as well. Once again, I want to thank you, Mark Ash, for um, just a very clear presentation so we know how to advocate for our loved ones or other people, our friends. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that information. And thank you all for tuning in.